This is the principle of manna. You get exactly what you need, what is healthy, and no more. Anything that is hoarded for the future becomes wormy and inedible. So today, we're visiting Alaska. And not a park that you can get to in a normal way. If you want to go to the gates of the Arctic or to Kobuk National Park, you have to fly into them or you have to hike into them or one of them you can boat into them. But there are no roads that lead you to these national parks. And one of the things these two national parks teach us, they are up in the Arctic Circle. And they were created recently because the land of Alaska we haven't, as a country, owned for long. But those parks that were created were created in this vast wilderness area and are the biggest national parks we actually have in that combined territory of, um, they have different names, but it creates this whole huge space above the Arctic Circle in Alaska. And this is a spot that is so remote that people just don't jump in to go see it. And when we were creating these national parks, one of the things that the government had to do is figure out how to keep it possible for the native people to continue to live the lifestyle that they had always had. So what did that look like? For 11,000 years, the native Eskimo Alaskans, and I'm going to give you their real name, and I'm only probably going to say it once, and I'm going to say it really badly. Nunam Miut are the ones that live in the Arctic National Park. And the, the reason they had trouble creating the park was how did they keep a space for the native people? Because the way they survived in the Arctic was through the hunting of, that's why you're seeing lots of pictures of caribou. They live and thrive with caribou. That their life and survival is tied up with the life and survival of the caribou. They followed and were the last nomadic people that we had in the United States who followed the herds of caribou as they migrated north and migrated south based upon the weather. All of their rituals and identity and spirituality is combined with what does it take to survive in this spot and be in relationship with the animals of that area. And so, if you look at the history of the Eskimo people in this region, you will find that they use the, every part of the caribou for something that is either nourishing them feeding them, so the meat and the bones, the broth that they can create of what is left. Or they're using the hides to create clothing, boots, mittens, cloaks. To create, they used to, before we built a village for them, live in tents that were made out of caribou hide, covered in blankets made out of caribou. And much of their um, they stitched it all together with the tendons of the caribou. And so for a vegetarian, this is really kind of gross, but, but it teaches us an important lesson that Moses also teaches us, right? That when you are interacting with your planet, with the place and space that you've chosen to live, that you need to learn what you can use and keep healthy in that space, right? What you can grow and help thrive. And that's what they did with the caribou, because if they overhunted, then they wouldn't have enough caribou the next year mating and making more caribou so they could hunt again, right? So they had to learn how you 
Choose them at the right time of year, how you hunt the right type of caribou, and how you make sure that the herds flourish and survive so that you also can flourish and survive. And when you're stuck in this spot, because remember I told you the only way you could get there is to fly in and then hike into this spot. There isn't a road going there. That means before there was even a thought of airplanes, all they had was what they encountered in that spot because not many people are going to be hiking from a big city out into this part of Alaska, right? Adventurers would. So the trade would not be consistent. And so they had to learn to live with what they had and what was available for them. And so when we created this national park, the government had to figure out a rule of how they could keep it so that they could have a subsistence level of life. How they could be allowed, because in most national parks there are major rules about how you can hunt and when you can hunt and what you can hunt and what you can do to hunt and if you can even hunt certain animals. In Alaska, the rule has these exceptions for native Alaskans that are, go beyond just the Eskimos and the native indigenous people. So for people who are born Alaskan, that they have the ability to go out and hunt the way that they have always hunted. In our biblical passage, part of the problem and part of the concern and anxiety amongst the people is, what do we do now that we are out in the desert? How do we survive in this new landscape that we don't know what to do with? We don't know where you find food here. Like the food that we had normally made is not going to be here. Yeah, we may have the animals that we brought with us, but is that enough for us to thrive and survive in this new location, in this new spot? How do we make it? And so the people are anxious. They don't know how they will survive, what they will do. And so they start grumbling. And if you read Exodus, these people grumble a lot. Like, they grumble every couple of paragraphs that nothing is ever right which is part of the reason they have to wander for 40 years to figure out their grumbling, right? And the grumbling that happens today is over the fact that they're fearful about food. They don't know if there will be enough to feed themselves, if they can survive and thrive in this new, changed environment in which they are in. And so they complain. They complain about Moses and Aaron bringing them out into this wilderness area where there isn't the food that they are used to. And they complain about God causing this to happen. And so in our story today, God hears their complaints and hears Moses' complaints about their complaints and says to them, here's what's going to happen. There's going to be bread for you to eat every morning, enough to fill you up and no more. And there will be meat for you every evening, enough to satisfy your hunger and fill your need. And here's the rule that I'm giving you about this about this abundant resource that I'm giving you. Only take what you need. You know how that goes, right? Guys, you put a bowl of M&Ms in front of a bunch of five-year-olds, and what is going to happen? Especially if you say to them, only take what you need. That bowl is going to be empty or there until their tummies are full, right? So the first time this happens, when that manna appears in the morning, 
Some people gather more because they're fearful. Right? They're afraid, they're in a new environment, they don't know what will happen. So they take more than they would need to fill themselves because they don't know what's coming next. They fill their baskets to the brim because they want to make sure that they will never be hungry again. And if you've ever been hungry, you know that feeling. You always have, when you have extra money, you buy extra food so that there's food in your pantry. So they filled up with too much. But there were some who must not have liked the job, right, of having to pick the manna. So they only took a little bit, and it wasn't really as much as they needed in order to survive. And so their baskets had a little. But at the end of the day, all they had was what they needed to be full and to be healthy. And the rest of it, so if you collected too much because you were worried, it all became inedible, rotten, and wormy. If you hadn't taken enough, it magically refilled itself so that there was enough for you to be satisfied. I think this is an important lesson for us. That this story about Moses and the people teaches us about what are our limits and what our limits should be. Right? Because that principle of manna is only take enough, only have enough that will keep you healthy. You don't need more than that. And I will admit, I am like the rest of you. I have more books than any person on the planet needs. Like, any time I have moved, the moving companies groan when they see me because it's boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of books, which are heavier than the furniture. That it isn't an easy principle, right? This idea that we only have enough. It's a hard principle to follow. It's a hard principle to take. Because some of us, it's because of a love and a passion. Like every time you read a book, like you just want to keep it and hold it if you're a nerd, right? You have trouble using the library because you physically want that book. Even if you, 20 years later, have never read it again, you still want that book. But what is it that you need, that you fill your house up with? And how can we start thinking about it differently? Because I know now that I am older and getting to that point where you start thinking about, oh, that's a lot of stuff I have. A lot of stuff. What is it that I really need? Which of those books do I need because of the memory? Which of those books do I need because I use them? And which of those books can I give to someone else to love and enjoy for a while? That's what the manna principle is about, right? Teaching us how we take that thing that we want to hoard, that we want to fill our basket with, and figure out what's enough, what makes us healthy, what will lead us to wholeness, but also to know that we don't need more than that, that it's okay to say, this is enough, that I have enough, and it's really bad now that you can have it on your phone. Because you can have millions of books and they take up no space. So how do we live in those principles? How do we determine what is enough? That's why this Alaskan National Park is an interesting case study in it, right? Because even today, now that they don't have to take the dog sleds out, 
to hunt anymore. Now that they have built shelters and homes in a village within the actual national park, they still build their life around the caribou and the hunting and migration patterns. They still live a life that when we look at it from the outside goes, I don't know if I could do that. And yet they thrive and survive and live in that pattern that they have had for thousands of years. And maybe part of our cultural problem is that we forgot that. With everything being so easy to get, we forgot that we don't need as much as we have. We need to remember those stories we heard from our grandmas and our great-grandmas about how they saved. Like, my grandmother had every, every cottage cheese container that there ever existed until they fell apart. But she taught me that, that you use what you have not just once or twice, but you use it to keep your impact low. But also because in a world where things seem so disposable, we can create a world that doesn't have to live like that. So remember the manna principle. Gather what you need to live a healthy life. Gather enough for what you need. But if you take too much, it might become inedible and wormy. So beware. Amen.